Hey guys, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna start this message a little bit differently than, than, than I start, uh, probably because it's, it's serious. I'm gonna tell you about this message, and in times past, I would be assigned something to preach, like this message, I'm, I'm assigned today to preach, do you have Jesus or not? Do you have Jesus or not? So in times past, I would, uh, I, I, would, I would have grabbed this message and I would have been like, oh, oh, oh yeah, I'm gonna step on these people's toes and, and I'm gonna give it to them. That's what, that's what I would do. Uh, it actually reminds me of a time when we, we, were, uh, we were global uh, missionaries in Spain and we were uh, out during this time called Semana Santa and uh, we would go out during this time and people uh, would carry these gigantic floats of Jesus and it was all leading up to Easter, so the week before Easter. And all night, all day, they would carry these floats around. And so our team decided in Spain to go share Christ with, with people in the streets. And so I remember, uh, I remember uh, getting a hold of this guy. And uh, I, I said, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the gospel differently today. And so I got a hold of him and I said, listen, you need to believe in Christ now. You need to believe in Christ because of his death, burial, and resurrection, how he paid for your sins. And you, if you don't believe, yes, there's going to be judgment and wrath and pain that's going to rain down on you. And I remember my face, but, but the more regretful thing is I, I remember the regret that I feel even today of shoving the gospel shoving what is supposed to be good news in somebody's face. And I, I have this true regret, and I have a, I have a wound from doing this, and it, it's, a, it's a wound that I don't want to go away. I don't want to go away because it, it, it reminds me that I don't want to do it again. I was a bit like, a, this is <laughs> such a weird example, but a, a copperhead, right? When, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my parents would always say, stay away from the baby copperheads, like the snakes. Uh, the big ones aren't as poisonous as the babies. And I was a poisonous Christian at first, just trying to get the gospel down people's throats. And, and so today, I do want to share in serious tenderness, in serious importance, in serious compassion, we recently had a, a, a guy even, he died in our own congregation and it was, it was abrupt. We didn't know it was gonna, gonna happen. And I, I, I thought, like what happens if my brother, he's not a follower of Christ, what happens if, what happens if my brother died tomorrow? How would, I, how would I share the great message of Christ with him? And listen, I would do it in earnestness. I would do it with seriousness, but I would do it with the utmost compassion, the utmost tenderness, the utmost joy. What old preachers used to say, they would say, I, I am a dying man, just like you, preaching to dying men. So I'm a dying man preaching to, to dying men. See, we're in this series called Signs of Life, and we've worked through if you have life in Christ, you will be obedient. If you have life in, in Christ, you will, you will help and love others. If you have life in Christ, you will follow the Spirit of God. And today is, is do you have Jesus or not? If you have Christ, you will have life. And so this message, it could be, and I'm not trying to say it in an arrogant way, but this message could be the most important message of your life the most important message of the year, definitely the most important of this, this series. And so let's just pray right now that, that Christ would reveal to you, to me, if we have him, if we actually are blood-bought, saved followers of Jesus. So let's just pray that he would do that right now. Why don't you pray with me? Father, I... Uh, I come to you as, a, as a, dying, a dying man, but only my body, because I know I have you. And so I just pray as, as uh, we're together for these next uh, few minutes that you would answer each person that hears this message. Do they have Christ? Do they have you, Jesus, or not? Lead us. And if, if, if there are people that, 
that admit and confess that they don't have they don't have Christ would you open their eyes God I beg you would you just open their eyes where they could they could see you where they could perceive you where they could actually experience the warmth of your love the warmth of your embrace and that they could go from from death to life and so so help us we love you pray all these things in your son's name Jesus amen so think back to that day like you remember that day when when Christ when God saved you can you remember I, I remember that day I was, I, I was actually in a little church plant and we, we were listening to this thing called the Purpose Driven Life on a, on a screen. But what happened was the pastor hopped up and, and he said, you know, to, you have to believe in Christ to be saved. And so I remember myself walking down an aisle. I even was like, what am I, what am I doing right now to an altar? And I bowed down at this altar, and, and I remember the phrase I even used. I, I, I bowed down on this altar. I was 19 years old, and, and, and I, I just remember God saying, God, here, here's my whole life. I didn't pray a, a, a perfect prayer according to, to the scriptures, but I just said, here's my life, God. Do whatever you want to with it. I want to love your son, Jesus. I know you paid for my sin, and so save me. My life's completely yours. Do whatever you want to with it. I didn't grow up in church. In fact, my dad would, would drive me from our house to the church. I would hop out and I would go with my grandma and, and, and then I would uh, drive back to her house and he would meet us there. He would, he would skip church. He goes to church, church now, but he would, he would skip it. I remember at one point I was, I was 16 years old. I, I had just uh, got up from a bender. If you don't know what a bender is, ask your parents. Okay, so I just got up from a bender and I go to church. I drove there by myself and, and I sat through a whole service and there were four men at the, the very front of the church and I walk up there and I, I say, is this, is this all there is to Christianity? And I looked at all the men's faces and, and all four of them said, yeah, this is it. And I turned around and I purposed in my heart to never, ever go to church again. But see, I met this guy in college. And without drugs, without drinking, without chasing anything, he had joy. He had joy and I desired it so much that I started going to church with him because I saw something in him that, that I desired. And this guy, he, he started sharing Christ with me with his words, but, but with his actions as well. Which what's, it's, it's what brings us to 1 John chapter 5, verse 9. Check this out. That's where we'll be today. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9. He says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he testified of his son. He says, if we received, like if we've taken by the hand, if we've laid hold on, if we've actually grabbed and received this thing, this witness, this evidence, this, this record, if we've witnessed it from men, if we've taken this evidence from men, then God's evidence, God's witness, God's record is, is greater. Right here, what he's saying is, is man's witness is weak and temporal and feeble, but God but God's is, is strong and, and eternal and, and mighty. See, he has powerful evidence. And right here, he's saying that the, the evidence of God is the, the testimony of, of his dear son. Christ is the evidence of God. That is what God's name actually means here when it says that he is the witness of God. It's that he is the supreme divinity. That God is superior over any story, over any testimony, over any evidence. So he is superior. But so often what we do is we, we start to think it, we, th we make it and think about our testimony, about me, myself, and I. We start with that place of self-centeredness. It's all about my testimony. It, it, but the, the truth of the matter is, it's actually all about the evidence of what he did, about what God has done. A more accurate way of actually sharing is, is can I share his testimony in me? That's, that's the more accurate way. 
but we start at the wrong place. And, and if our testimonies are all about us and a little bit about Christ, we're probably doing it wrong. The verse says he is greater. Like he is greater. And what, what makes his evidence greater? Jesus does. Jesus, like the Christ, the son of the living God. If God himself were on the witness stand, would you believe what God said? Would you trust his story? Would you trust his testimony? And yes, yes, people of faith would, would say yes. And right here, you know what Christ would say? If, uh, you, know what, you know what God would say if he was on the witness stand? He would say, here is my son. Hear him. He actually goes on to say that in verse 10, 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God. He who believes in the Son of God has witness, has the evidence, has the story in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. So right here, he, he says, he, he that believes, he that has a wholehearted faith, he that thinks to be true, that's persuaded of the son, has witness. Those, those that have believed, you have the evidence of the, the Son of God with you. It's called the Spirit of God. But for those that don't believe, this is where he gets really serious. Those that do not believe the story of God, that do not believe the evidence of God, you have made him a, a liar. You don't believe that Jesus is God. You don't believe that, that he created the world and everything in it. You don't believe that he died. You don't believe that he was buried. You don't believe that he was resurrected, that he was seen by over 500 people and that your sins can be forgiven with wholehearted faith. And essentially what you're saying is that you do not believe the story of Christ. What you're saying is that actually I don't believe God exists. And in fact, that makes you an atheist. And ultimately... You miss out on true truth because true truth is only found in the sun. It's only found in the sun, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. And anything outside of the sun is a lie. Did you catch that? Anything out, the, out of the sun is a, is a lie. John, the, the writer of the book, he even doubles down. Look at verse 11. And it says, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And if you're not sure what the evidence is, what the testimony is, it is this, that he has given us eternal life. That there is one place that is found that if you do not believe it, you have no foundation. You have no foundation of love. You have no foundation of belief or righteousness or, or holiness because, because Jesus is, is all. He, he is everything. He is our life. And without him, you have no truth. You can't tell the purpose of the sky. You can't tell the purpose of the ocean or the, the trees or the, the mountains or rivers or, or, or rain. You think that it's only part of an ecosystem, but you miss out that God created all of those things for his glory and for worship and for our enjoyment. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on a second. So, Raby, are you saying that a person that doesn't follow Christ cannot enjoy nature or things on this earth? I'm not saying that exactly. What I'm saying is that they can't enjoy those things to their full extent. Because without Christ, without Jesus, you experience those things in the here and now, in the temporal, when God is whispering all along, all of those things speak of me. Those things are about me. They are pointing you to me. See, eternal life is not found within yourself. You don't go to yourself. Eternal life is not just some made up religion, but eternal life is in the Son. When He is in us and, and we're in Him. 
I recently heard of this story of this Icelandic woman where uh, she, she went missing. I just heard this at a conference I was at just a couple weeks ago. And this woman, she's touring Iceland. The, the woman broke off the tour and uh, the tour group. She, she changed her clothes. She returned to the tour bus in, in, in different clothes, in a different outfit. And, and the rest of her tour group didn't, didn't recognize her. And then she heard the description of the missing person and she goes, I, don't, I wonder who that is. And then she began assisting the search like party. She began assisting them and, and the Coast Guard was even prepared to send a helicopter out until hours later at 3 a.m. on a Sunday, the party finally realized that alas, the woman they were looking for all along was with them. <laughs> the search was called off and, and she was reportedly found safe and sound by herself. She was found by herself. How often is that? That's how we are. How many times have you tried to look within yourself to find yourself? And if you continue to do that, you're just like that woman wandering and wandering and, and, and wandering. Where if you really want to find out who you are, Look at Christ. Look unto Jesus. And you'll have something real and substantial. You'll, you, you'll actually look at Christ and you'll see his perfection. And then eventually you'll, you'll look at yourself and you'll go, Oh my goodness, I have a deep need. I have a deep need because I'm what is, is called, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a sinner. I've, I've broken God's law. I've broken commandments I, because I've seen perfection. I've seen the exact way to live and I know I don't live that way. And so I have this deep need and eventually I'll, I'll, I'll cry out for Christ. Eventually you'll cry out for Christ and you'll, you'll, the, this realization will occur that, wait, I've, I've seen Christ and I've seen him and I've realized that I've inherited eternal life, eternal life, because eternal life is only found in the Son. And if you have the Son, you have eternal life. See, this body can go in the ground, but listen, I will still be alive when this body goes in the ground. I will be with Christ. Have you ever thought what it's going to be like to see Jesus face to face? Like actually see him. Can you imagine it? Just think about it. I think of the face of power under control that looks on the saints. That's followers of Jesus. That's you and I that looks on the saints with grace and care and acceptance and tenderness and delight and joy. For years, I... I missed this. For years, I missed this. That was the illustration right at the very beginning during Samana Santa, but, but it continued on in my life and, and where, where I missed out and I enjoyed preaching about the wrath of God, the judgment of God, and, and uh, the sin. I, I enjoyed uh, preaching about that. And then now, now I want to share it as what some people call in a way of serious joy where I'm, I'm treading lightly. But there, there was a time when I, I was a one-man wrecking crew. I was a one-man wrecking crew when I worked at Hertz Equipment Rental, and I was a one-man wrecking crew with Darren and, and Lynn and Doug and Jimmy and Matt and Andrew and Jason and, and Rob and, and Chuck. I was relent with, relentless with those guys. And one day my, my, my boss, Doug, came up to me and he goes, Hey, Raby. You know, you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. Man, it was like a knife in the heart. I was like, what? Oh, see God, his, his spirit, his word, his son, they are sweet. But I've been splashing vinegar on these guys and I was starting with the judgment of God. I was overemphasizing it. Vinegar, you ever smell vinegar? Man, two, t two times a year when I was a kid, my mom would clean our coffee maker out with vinegar. You want to talk about clearing out a house? It would cl clear out the whole house. We would not want to be in there. And listen, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying avoid the facts of sin. 
I'm not saying avoid the, the, the facts of judgment and wrath. I'm simply saying, if you speak those things, please, and I want to even right now in this moment, I want to speak them with tenderness, with, with care, with, with compassion. Right now, I want you to have and know the Son. This is what John does when he continues. He says this very thing in verse 12. He says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. If you have the Son, you have life. And to have the Son, it carries the idea of of holding on to, of, of actually wearing It's where your mind is like captivated, possessed. It is focused on Christ, where you're not just like existing in life, but but you have a real life, a real life. And if you're not following Jesus, you, you actually are not living. Yes, you may be upright walking on the earth, but you're not experiencing true joy. You're not experiencing true happiness. You are colorblind to this world where there's a dullness where you seem to either be existing or just searching for the next thing, and you miss out on genuine, active, vigorous devotion for Christ and in Christ, where you have life. If you're not clinging onto the sun, you, 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 you don't have life, and you will, you will die not knowing true love, not knowing true vitality, true satisfaction, true treasure, can a person, can a person really enjoy finely crafted things, watches, cars, architecture, without knowing the creator and the first designer? Can a person really rest when true rest is only found in Christ? Can a person enjoy the vastness of the ocean without knowing that God placed it there? Can a person enjoy a fine meal Can they enjoy a fine meal without prescribing greatness to our God for these great gifts? Can a a person experience the perfection of heaven without Christ? He who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. They have a, a dim life, a foggy life. So why why did John say these things? He says, these things I've written to you that believe. I've written to those that believe in the name of the Son of God, the Son of God, the the Son of righteousness, Jesus Christ, the, the King, the Lord of Lords, yes, the King of Kings, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Jesus is the one that gives us true life. John wrote these things to followers of Christ and those that believed and they proclaimed Christ as their almighty deliverer. They believed on the only name that saves and they needed to be reminded constantly, wait, hang on to the sun, hang on to the sun. You want true, tangible, real life? Hang on to the sun. So he wrote this to you and to me, to the church that we may know, that we may be aware, that we would behold, that we would perceive, that that we could see eternal life and and that we wouldn't stop trying to see it and and that we would keep looking and keep searching and, and keep beholding because we want to see him and we want to we want to sense him. And I recently even heard somebody say like, "Man, you should live life drunk." No, 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 but not not drunk on alcohol, but drunken on Christ, intoxicated with Christ, infatuated with Christ, where you are drunk in the eyes from looking at Christ. And if it's getting old to you, then then change your perspective. Look at it from a different angle. Get around people that know Christ in a different way than you do. Or or look at your own sinfulness. Like look down and you look at your own sinfulness and and, and you say, oh my goodness, I have a gift. I have a gift in, in rejoicing because in Christ's incredible, stupendous, outrageous love, He gave us, gifted us with eternal life 
with eternal joy and eternal abundant life. See, you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you have the Son and that you can know you have eternal life in the Son. This is the good news. This is the good news. And this good news pushes us to ask, do you have the Son? Do you have Jesus or not? Eventually, you will realize that, yes, Christ died, that he was buried, that he resurrected, and he showed his power over death, and he defeated the grave, and he said, I have victory over death. I have victory over the grave. And and because of that, I am proclaiming that your sins have been blotted out. Every time you've broken the law, any time you've trusted in yourself rather than Christ, any time you had a prideful way, any time you lusted or looked at porn or chased after some lame thing of this world, I have paid for it. I have blotted out all of those times so you could be refreshed. Do you realize that he's done that for you? that he's freed you from everything that's unrighteous, everything that's unholy, everything that's wrong and sin, and he's called you his own. You know, part of my role uh, as a pastor is to, to warn of some of the dangers and pitfalls that are, that, that are coming ahead for those people that say, yes, I, I have Christ. And we have a danger and we have this enemy we have this enemy that, that is not wanting you to hear what I'm about to say, that he's not wanting you to hear what I just said. And if you believe what I've said, he doesn't want you to continue in that belief. He wants to snatch it right out of your heart, your mind, and your life. And John chapter 10, verse 10 confirms this. He says, the thief, the enemy, he does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. We have an enemy and he wants to steal the things of God. He wants to destroy and kill the things of God in our lives that that we would not live and we would not hang on to the son. And he's a liar and he will use any means necessary for you not to know Jesus, to not live for Jesus, for you not to remember Jesus, and for you not to believe in Jesus. There is an enemy against the sun. And newsflash, if there's an enemy against the sun, we have that same enemy. But look at the verse again. Yes, there is the thief that comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. Compare and contrast. We have an enemy that is stealing and pulling away from us, but then we have this great God that gives us the abundant life. The super abundant life. That's what that, it means superior in quantity and quality. It's violent excess of Christ in us, where we're exceedingly, abundantly, more properly, thoroughly, and completely knowing who Christ is, where you would live complete, where you would pursue and chase chase Christ through the reading of his word, where you would attend church, where you would live on mission because you know Christ and that we're on mission trying to fill heaven with more followers of Christ. But we have this enemy. And church folks uh, are, need the constant reminder of things like Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We've got this enemy, and this enemy spreads lies, and we get beat up, and we forget that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, this is a message worth sharing. You're not sentenced to damnation with Christ. You are sentenced to walk in the Spirit, following Christ, becoming like Him, practicing His ways, and and doing it in a community that lives and breathes and proclaims, yes, Jesus is all, where you can actually live like you're forgiven. And John gives us a litmus test earlier in the chapter. Listen to 1 John chapter 2. He says, now, We know that we 
know him. We know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So what are his commandments? His commandments hang on one thing, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love him. And the second commandment is like the first, that you would love others just as you love yourself. You have to love God and you have to love others. And you can't love others without your primary preeminent love being for the triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you love him, you will know him. If you love him, you will know him. So I want to give you a litmus test and I want to give you, I'm going to pause a little bit in here and, and I want you to think through these questions. And the first direct, bold question is, do you have Jesus or not? Do you have Jesus or not? You know, uh, uh, the the theologians of old or pastors of old, they had 19 questions to figure out if a person was saved. I'm going to give you eight. Are eight too many? Probably, but that's okay. We're going to have eight. And so... Answer this for me. Do you know the gospel? Do you know the good news? Do you know the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and that he was seen by 500 people and that your sins would be blotted out by what he did? Do you know the gospel? Do you hate your sin? When you sin, do you hate it? Do you feel conviction? That's a different way to say it for the churchy way to say it is, do you feel conviction over your sin? Do you desire, do you ever desire to read the word? Do you desire to pray? Do you desire God? Do you desire God? Do you sense the Spirit of God in your life. Romans chapter 8 says that His Spirit confirms with our spirit that in fact we are a child of God. So do you sense that the Spirit dwells in you? Do you have a desire to share the love of Christ with others? Do you have any spiritual fruit? Have you grown in the last six months? Are you different than you were the last six months? Do you have fruit? Have you led somebody to Christ? Have you gained in your knowledge of Christ? Have you gained in your knowledge? It's very simple. Do you know more about Christ than you did yesterday or the day before or last year? Do you know? Are you more sanctified? That's a churchy word for being more set apart where I'm like a bird sanctuary is how Tim always uses it, where I'm set apart in a, an environment where I'm more like Christ today than I was yesterday. Do you have spiritual fruit? So the ultimate question for us is, do you have Jesus or not? Do you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? You need to. You need to proclaim today that you are my Lord, my Savior, my King. Be like me when I was 19 years old where you say, Christ, my whole life is yours. Here, here's a prayer. I'm just going to pray right now for us. Let's, let's pray together. Father, I, uh, I just want to come to you right now and anybody that, that would sense that they do not have Jesus, God, that they would trust. They would put their wholehearted faith, their wholehearted trust in your death, your burial, your resurrection, that it has paid for their sins that they would even proclaim it and they would pray this with me right here. God, I, I, I know that I've broken your all. I need you desperately. Would you save me from all of my unrighteousness? I'm trusting in the, the cross, the, the, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus to save me. So would you please save me? God, I need you now. God, I pray for those people and I pray that you would be, be near them and that they would be prompted to tell somebody, I gave my life to Christ today. God, have your will in your way. We love you. Pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.